today. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Nice to gather together. Um, what a time to be alive, right? Um, um, we're reminded as believers, not just what's happening in our world, but um, our world that desperately needs God. We're thinking about Afghanistan in such instability. Um, uh, the Christians there in such vulnerability, people fleeing and in desperation. We think, or we're reminded as, as the people of God, we can't just live in a tunnel, right? It's not just like, am I happy or not? We're the light of the world. We think about um, more than, more than 2,000 people who have died in Haiti and um, through um, a tragic earthquake. And we still, our father is still Jehovah Shalom, Amen. And he has invited us to be carriers of shalom. As we start today, I don't want us just to gather like, okay, God, what's in it for me today? I want to remind us who we are. I think about that passage in Timothy. We can put that up there. In 2 Timothy 2, 4, um, let's, make, let's read this together. It says, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather to please his commanding officer. I want to remind us that we are the people of God. We have been enlisted into the army of the Lord, which means that our agenda has changed, or it's supposed to, right? Which means when people weep, we weep. When they mourn, we mourn, and we look to care and be a part of the healing process on behalf of God. And yet what a time, because we are feeling the shakingness, right? We have needs. We have challenges, and yet... We're reminded, why are we getting, lo we get getting lost in civilian affairs? We, we're a part of the army of God, and we have divine marching orders. And so I want to start this morning with a place of Godwardness, not just civilian affairs down here, but remembering who we are. And in light of those who are aching right now, that we wouldn't just wall off and us try to survive. Isn't it amazing how... So many people are surviving. So many Christians are just in survival mode, and yet we are supposed to be not only thriving, even in the midst of adversity, but we're supposed to be the wells that give out free water, right? Living water. We were given, and then we get to offer to others. So it's an amazing time to be alive. Things are shaking. This world is going crazy, and yet we got to be chosen by God to be alive right now. I don't want to miss the adventure. Amen. Let's join this morning and start our eyes, put our eyes on the Lord, and we'll remind ourselves of this amazing grace as we sing. Why don't you stand up together? Father, we look to you. We thank you for the privilege to be known as your people. We confess our, um, our, vulner our vulnerability to keep our eyes on ourselves. We confess, God, when things are shaking, we just want to bunker in and think of our world and our network, and yet you have still invited us to have your heart. You, as you, are, you said you're near to the brokenhearted and you save those who are crushed in spirit. We think of those people terrorized in Afghanistan right now where fear is gripping them. We think of the, the continued heartache and loss, mourning going on in Haiti. And Lord, keep us from being immune to the ache. And then speak to us now how to walk with you. We don't have ability to, to um, help apart from you, but you said... As we abide in you, that apart from you, we can do nothing and we would bear much fruit. So we love you. We look to you today. We thank you that we get to be your people. And as we begin in our worship, we thank you that we can sing about this amazing grace. We love you and pray that you be glorified as we praise. In Jesus' name, everybody said.
It's all out of gratitude. Come on, sing it together. Say, who brings our who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of Glory, the King of Glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shine like the sun.
goodness is running after, is running after me. It amazes me, God. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. My life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Come on, say, stay to him. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Through all of it, Jesus. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Oh, Father. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Say together. They're on the cross they made for sinners. For every curse is love is on. But not the bread that it was finished. But not the end. But not the end we could have known. For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice? What sacrifice was made And the hell is wrong we say
eyes are on you. You are the champion of the universe. In a world where everybody's trying to get attention, you just chose to become a suffering servant. Humble yourself from godhood to a mortal to being trampled by mortals. All because God so loved the world. Your greatness is proved in your humility and sacrifice. Give us the grace to follow your example. And that's why we honor you today. In Jesus' name, all God's people say, amen. You can be seated. Good morning. Uh, welcome to campus. How amazing is this worship time? I am blessed every week, and I just, I just want to thank you. Um, I am Amy Duick. And I'm John Duick. We're happy you can join us today and be a part of this. We have a uh, few things to let you know about. We're glad you can join us at any time. If you are a first-time visitor, there is a welcome bag, a little gift for you. It is outside if you walk back out at the end of service to the left at the hospitality center, the octagonal building. Uh, they'll give you a small um, uh, packet of information about this church to let you know all that we have happening here and how you can get involved in that. Uh, there's also a connection card in front of you, so if you could fill that out, we'd appreciate it, whether you are returning, if you're here all the time. That's just a way to let the church staff and elders know about prayer requests, praises, things they can be coming alongside you. There's a lot going on for all of us, whether we're here at church or in our personal lives, and that's just one more way to stay connected and let us know how to come alongside you with all of that. So we have a lot of things going on, getting um, things that are getting started in the fall. Um, first of all, we have growth groups that are starting up again. Um, whether you have, uh, whether you're a part of a Sunday school class and you want to to have another opportunity to connect with maybe a smaller group, or you're involved in ministries already on Sunday mornings and you're not able to be a part of a Sunday school class, this is a great opportunity for you to be able to connect with other believers. Um, and the, the, you can sign up for those groups um, online. Another event coming up is this Thursday night is our men's dinner. So if you would like to be a part of that, get to uh, see some old friends, meet some new friends. That's going to be again this Thursday. It is preferred that you let us know that you are coming to that. You can do that on the connection card or you can go online to do it. But that way they can get a regular count for what's happening and get the, the numbers and food prepared for that. Also, if you are 18 and under, it is free to attend this. So grab your son, grandson, nephew, uh, Random kid off the street, because you can feed him for free at this thing. Maybe, but tell the parents. But uh, we'd love to see a large turnout for this. And again, under 18, no charge to attend this. But do uh, pre-register if possible. But I'm sure if you just showed up, it'd be OK. So um, Also, Awana is beginning. So sign up for that. Sign up is outside. You can also do that online. Uh, that begins on September 8th. So get your child signed up. But that's also a way that you could be a part of something. Awana requires a lot of people to make this happen. So everything from. Uh, giving a story, helping with games, or simply sitting and listening to students say their verses is a great way to encourage and be a part of that. So you can sign up to be part of Awana. You can get your kids signed up for Awana. There is a $10 early bird discount. And I'll tell you right now, both Anthony O'Neill and Dave Ramsey would say, take advantage of that. So uh, <laughs> register for Awana soon. Also, um, we have the opportunity to hear um, Grant Smith. Um, he is going to give um, a um, concert, an organ concert at the Palm Campus um, on Sunday, August 29th. Um, for those of you who don't know about uh, like how incredible this is, um, so a piano keyboard has 88 keys. Well how done. many keys Correct? does an organ have, Amy? Correct. Well done, so, Amy. So, so he is actually playing on three levels of 61 keys each, so that's 183 keys, and it has over 50 stops. And this Great. is over 2,000 pipes, ranging from 16 feet to the size of a pencil, he told me. So it's pretty incredible. It's and, it, and actually, we joked um, at the last concert that Luke is kind of the star because he wouldn't be able to do it without his brother turning the pages for him. So. <laughs> So do come out for all these things. Get involved in this. Uh, we'd love to see a good turnout for that. At this point, we're going to move towards our offering. I'd like to invite the men to come forward. If you're not prepared for this morning's offering, there is a box in the back. You can always go to the Give Now portion online to do that. Um, and as uh, my, new fa my favorite new pastor, Warmadam, said, you know the drill how to do this. All right, so if you'd bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can be here today for this uh, beautiful time together, worshiping through music, through the word, through giving. Uh, you give us so many opportunities to come up uh, in front of you, and we thank you for that. We give you this day, all this before us, and all that we are, helps we pour it out in service for you. Amen.
Amen. Jesus said, blessed is the one who stays waiting and watchful for my return. And in a time of so much shaking, we got to keep our eyes up to the heavens. This is Keep Watching. Keep watching toward heaven. Come on, put your hands together like this. Keep watching while waiting. Keep watching toward heaven. Keep watching while waiting on Jesus. Passing through, and don't forget that God has not, no, He hasn't failed or forgotten you. So we just keep watching toward heaven. craving cause heaven isn't heaven without you and we realize Lord this land is lacking it leaves us wanting cause there can be no heaven without you so much worship team good morning everyone it is so good to be with you this morning man I'm excited to be here how many of you have heard of the great missionary uh, to India by the name of John Nelson Hyde his nickname was praying Hyde anyone not too many of you I'm excited I'm going to tell you a little bit about this man today in 1892 he responded to God's call and he relocated his life to Punjab India 
And at the time, there were nearly a million unbelievers in an area that only five missionaries were serving. And initially as he got there, man, it was, it was, it was slow and painful labor. Uh, just very few converts. And when somebody did come to Christ, they immediately faced persecution. But those challenges and those difficulties in his ministry drove him deeper into a life of prayer. In 1899, he began to spend entire nights interceding for the nation of India, just praying for a spiritual breakthrough. In fact, he spent so many nights praying on the cold, hard floor that by the time he died at the young age of 46, his heart had shifted from the left side of his chest over to the right side. He would labor in agony in prayer, crying out, Oh God, give me souls or I die. In 1908, he encountered God in prayer in a pretty spectacular way. He asked God for something that changed the course of his life. He prayed that God would grant him one convert a day, no less. One soul saved each and every day who would be ready to confess Christ in public and be baptized in His name. By the end of that year, folks, 400 people were saved. The following year, Hyde asked for God something even more spectacular. Guess what it was? Two souls a day. And the year after that, he doubled it again and asked God for four souls a day. Amazingly, God granted Hyde's request. Revival broke out in India. It's so sad. Well, I don't think anybody in here raised your hand. You don't even know who this guy was. But today it's estimated that millions of Christians, millions can trace their conversion back to the seeds of the Gospel which John, praying Hyde, planted in India. But that revival began, here's the thing, that, it began in large part because of a, a group of believers who gathered annually to pray together. They called themselves the Punjab Prayer Union, and Hyde was a founding member. Um, but to join the prayer union, you had to agree to five questions. I want to begin our time together by reading uh, these questions to you right now. You ready? Number one, we'll put them up on the screen. Are you praying for quickening in your own life, in the life of your fellow workers, and in the church? Number two, are you longing for greater power of the Holy Spirit in your own life and work? And are you convinced that you cannot go on without this power? Number three, will you pray that you may not be ashamed of Jesus? Number four, do you believe that prayer is the great means for securing this spiritual awakening? And number five, will you set apart one half hour each day as soon after noon as possible to pray for this awakening? And are you willing to pray till the awakening comes? As we begin this uh, message this morning, can I ask you, how's your prayer life? How many of you resonate with those five questions up there? You have a desperate ache in your soul because you recognize the depth of your own spiritual laziness and apathy. You realize you need the Holy Spirit to do this work. You need Him to quicken you and awaken you to this possibility that it's possible to have a prayer life that is transforming and exciting and deep and rich. You're convinced that you cannot go on without this power. You're desperately hungering for more of God. You want God to move in your life. You don't want uh, Christianity just as some formula. You don't want to be lukewarm. But you realize prayer is the great means for obtaining this spiritual awakening. Now, I realize maybe that's a lot to process before lunch on a Sunday morning. It may take a while for this message to sink in this week. Many of us, I think, are generally unsatisfied when it comes to our prayer life. We feel a little guilty that we don't pray more or, or that we don't have the desire to pray more. Some of us feel like we have trouble hearing from God 
when we pray. While others, we feel like, well, hey, I, I don't know exactly what to pray for. Or I'm, I'm worried that maybe I'm going to pray for the wrong things. The good news is that God wants us to pray. And He's willing to help us go deeper in our prayer lives. Romans 8.26 says, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So the Spirit of God helps us to pray. He teaches us to pray. And one of the ways He does that is by providing examples in Scripture of prayer. Powerful, anointed prayers that are inspired by God and they're written down in the Bible for our instruction. This morning we're going to look at one of those prayers as we continue in our series in the book of Philippians called The Joy of Unity. So this is a time to grab your Bible, uh, take out your study outlines, open up and turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. This morning we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 1 verses 9 through 11. And we'll begin by reading that. The Apostle Paul writes, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness with, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, last week we saw Paul's passion for prayer. In verse 3, he wrote to the Philippians, Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. We know from that verse that Paul prayed a lot for the Philippians, but what did he pray for? Well, in verses 9 through 11, we see the content here, the substance of what Paul prayed for them. And like most of his recorded prayers, this one is entirely occupied with their spiritual needs. In this short passage, I see seven prayers for a holy life. And before we jump in, I just want to kind of stop and think about that for a moment. Imagine what it would be like if the Apostle Paul could pray for you himself. I mean, he was such a powerful prayer warrior, such a mighty man of God. So if he could intercede for you, what do you think he would ask for? What would he pray for? I think we're looking at it right here. This passage cuts right into the heart of intercession. It reveals our deepest needs. And what that means, folks, is that our deepest needs are spiritual, not physical. That doesn't mean it's wrong to pray for our jobs or our marriages or our finances or our physical health. But in Paul's mind, all those things are secondary. The thing we need more than anything else is a holy life. And the very first thing that Paul prays for is that we would have more love. In verse 9, he says, This I pray, that your love may abound still more and more. The word abound means to have more than enough. To overflow with an abundance like a cup that's just spilling over or, or even a river that's flooding its banks. And as if that wasn't uh, vivid enough, Paul adds another phrase in here for good measure. He says, I pray that your love may abound more and more. Not just more. One more isn't enough. No, I pray that your love may swell and burst and overflow more and more. In other words, I pray that your love would never stop growing. Folks, we can love too little, but we can never love too much. We will never arrive at the place where we can say, I've loved enough. I'm done. I reached my quota. That's it. I'm done loving. No, agape love is always active. It always wants to help. 
It always wants to share, it wants to care, it wants to serve and give and change things for the better. Now, if that sounds impossible, humanly speaking, it is. That's why we need to pray for God's love to abound in our lives. In fact, if you study uh, the, the grammatical structure of these verses, this right here, this is the main verb. This is the number one thing Paul prayed is that our love as Christians would never stop growing. It should overflow and abound in our daily lives. It should characterize absolutely everything we do. And if that happens, there's a sense here in which everything else will fall into place. Everything else will come together. So the big question is, well, how does that happen? How can we make sure that our love abounds more and more? Number two, we need to pray for a life of knowledge and discernment. Look back at verse 9. Paul writes, This I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. How does our love abound? Well, two ways. It grows and matures and develops in knowledge and discernment. Those two elements provide the environment, or we might say the soil, in which love grows. The Greek word here uh, for knowledge is epignosis, referring to a deep, real, experiential knowledge of the things of God, like His character, His Word, His truth. The word discernment, on the other hand, refers to moral discretion. It's the ability to distinguish between good and evil. And Paul's point is that knowledge by itself is not enough. Obviously, Christians have to have uh, knowledge uh, to become believers. We have to have a knowledge and understanding of the Gospel. It's essential. But we also have to apply the truth of the Gospel. It's not enough to know what the Bible says. We have to know how it affects our daily life. That's where discernment comes in. So knowing and living go hand in hand. We need to grow in knowledge. And we need to grow in discernment of what's right and wrong. Those two things should always go together because without them, love is impossible. Now, let me give you an example. How many of you have seen the bumper stickers or the yard signs that say, love is love? How many of you have seen those around? Are you guys awake this morning? Really? Are we living in the same city? How many of you have seen those stickers? Love is love. This is becoming a mantra for those who advocate the LGBTQ lifestyle. And their argument, may, a sincere argument may go something like this. Hey, we love each other. We're kind to each other. We take care of each other. We make each other happy. We're in a committed relationship. Love is love, right? Love is love. Well, how should we reply to that? I would say, hopefully, in a very loving way. But I would suggest opening our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13 and reading verses 4 through 8 because that's God's definition of love. Look at it with me. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It's not self seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no account of wrongs. Love takes no pleasure in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. I, I want to highlight what uh, verse 6, just for, the, for this particular uh, topic. It says that love takes no pleasure in evil. In other words, love requires discernment. The ability to distinguish between good and evil. Love, by nature, can never celebrate sin. It can never participate in rebellion or disobedience to God. Furthermore, it says love rejoices in the truth. In other words, love requires knowledge. 
It requires knowing and believing God's Word. In a nutshell, folks, what this means is that love has an objective standard. People can't just make up their own ideas about love. God created love. In fact, you know the Bible says God is love. So if someone said to you, I love my dog and I want to get married. Hey, love is love, right? How would you respond to that? Well, if you have no objective standard of truth, no absolute definition of what love is, then what else can you say but, hey, I guess you're right. Go ahead and marry your dog. Who am I to tell you what's right and wrong? But if you believe that God is the Maker of heaven and earth, and that He has created the moral laws of the universe, He's revealed them to us in Holy Scripture, then you can reply, absolutely not. It's morally reprehensible to marry your dog because that is a violation of God's beautiful design and purpose for human sexuality. So you can see that in order for love to be real love and to grow and flourish the way God intended it, we have to have knowledge and discernment. Thirdly, we need to pray for a life committed to finding excellence. In verse 10, Paul continues, so that you may approve the things that are excellent. Notice the word, so that. They indicate this is the result of what has just been stated. In other words, when our love abounds in knowledge and discernment, the expected outcome is that we would be able to approve the things that are excellent. The verb approve means to test or examine the quality of something. In fact, it was used uh, with regards to metals or, or coins when they were inspected to determine if, if they had the right properties. Did they meet the minimum standard? And the word excellent, this is a great word, it means essential. Essential or superior in quality. When you take those terms together, here's what Paul is saying. I mean, let's put the cookies on the bottom shelf. Paul is saying, get your priorities straight. Understand what really matters in life. Understand what is essential. Understand what is superior. Folks, do you understand what really matters in life? I was thinking about the youth, and I said, it's not television or video games. Or cars, or houses, or, or, or bank accounts, and careers, or hobbies and adventures, or living a comfortable life. None of those things are necessarily wrong. They may even be good, but that doesn't mean they're best. There's a difference, sometimes a tremendous difference, between the things that are good and the things that are excellent. And Paul is saying to us this morning, listen, guys, life is short. Life is short. So spend your time on the things that have eternal value, like loving one another, serving God, sharing the Gospel, leading people to Christ. Those are the things that really matter in life. Pray that we will be able to approve the things that are excellent. And number four, pray for a life that is sincere and blameless. The word sincere is often translated pure. Maybe in your uh, Bible it says pure. But it's a fascinating word in Greek. Elekrines means held up to sunlight for inspection. Isn't that great? In the first century, fine pottery was very fragile and, and it could easily develop cracks. And on occasion, you can imagine people would take uh, those cracked vessels and they would try to sell them in the marketplace and what they would do is they would take wax and rub it into the cracks to try to cover over those imperfections and really the only way that you could tell if a vessel was sincere is by holding it up to the sunlight to be able to inspect it so when Paul prays for believers to be sincere, here's what he's saying. He, he doesn't want there to be any hidden cracks in your life. No wax trying to conceal your flaws. He wants you to be genuinely whole, to, have, to be a person who has integrity, 
No deception. No, no secret impurities. This word blameless is also really interesting. It means literally without stumbling. A few weeks ago, I was watching track and field uh, on the Olympics. I'm sure a lot of you were watching the Olympics, but I was amazed as they're running around the track and they're in a pack, how much elbowing and, and pushing and bumping was going on. And they're, they're going all full blast racing around the track. But as Christians, we shouldn't be throwing elbows and bumping people off the track. Uh, what this word is saying is there should be nothing in our life that offends other people or causes them to stumble. Is there anything in your life, in your witness, in your example that could cause other people to stumble? Number five, we should pray for a life lived in the expectation of Christ soon returned. Do you see it there in verse 10? Paul says, I pray that your love may abound more and more. So you can approve the things that are excellent. You can become sincere and blameless. But I pray that that would keep happening until the day of Christ. Until that glorious day when the blessed hope arrives and our Savior returns. So I want you just to kind of listen and soak this in. I'm going to read some verses about the return of Christ. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. Because we shall see Him as He is. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. Who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body. By the power that enables Him to subject all things to Himself. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for His appearing. Now when you see these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Therefore watch, because you do not know the day on which your Lord will come. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In an instant, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must be clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come to pass. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Behold, He is coming with the clouds and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him. Behold, I am coming soon. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. Is anybody awake in here this morning? Is anybody excited for Jesus Christ to come back? Give Him praise. This should motivate us to live this kind of life that is pleasing to God. It should motivate us. It should create a burning and a yearning in our hearts. Do you sense that? Do you feel that this morning? Look at the next point, number six. We should pray for a life filled with the fruit of righteousness. Verse 11, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ. Now personally, as I studied this prayer and just seeped in it and, and prayed through it, I think what's happening is this prayer is escalating. It's building and building to a crescendo. It started with Paul praying for our love to abound more and more. 
like seeds. He wants our love to grow and mature and ripen in the soil of knowledge and discernment. That, in turn, it enables us to approve the things that are excellent in life so that we can make good choices and be pure and blameless while we wait for the glorious return of our Savior. And when all of those things align and work together, Paul says there's going to be a harvest. Our lives will burst forth with the fruit of righteousness, resulting in the praise and glory of God. So what is the fruit of righteousness that Paul refers to here? Notice it's the fruit which comes through Jesus Christ. It's not the kind of fruit that can be produced in our own power. Just as the righteousness that we have is not our own, but comes through Christ, so the fruit that we bear is not our own. John 15.4 Jesus said, Abide in Me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine... Neither can you unless you abide in me. So what is the fruit? Well, it's the fruit of the Spirit listed in Galatians 5.22 and 23. It's the fruit of repentance described in Matthew 3.8. It's the fruit of good works mentioned in Colossians 1.10. It's any fruit that the Holy Spirit bears in our lives as we abide in Christ and walk in in righteousness. Do you see how that kind of fruit magnifies the Lord? Not ourselves. There's no room for boasting. There's no room for pride. There's no room for self here. Because this is not the kind of fruit that we can produce in our own strength. And so that brings us then to the summit of Paul's prayer. Lastly, number seven. We need to pray for a life that brings glory and praise to God. Folks, can I ask you, what is the ultimate purpose of your life? That's a pretty deep question, isn't it? What's the ultimate purpose? We have a lot of purposes, but what's the ultimate purpose? Would you say it's to glorify God or to glorify yourself? Would you rather praise the Lord or receive praise for yourself? Does God have first place in your life? Not second. Not third, but first place. Or is there some idol competing for your affection? Some other love? Some other passion? Some dream? Something that you're living for and pursuing? Anything that you love more than God is an idol. And that's a violation of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before Me. God has to have first place. Not second. And yet, as John Calvin said, the human heart is a factory of idols. Every one of us from his mother's womb is expert in inventing idols. And so folks, again, we need to pray. Do you think this kind of life Paul described in this passage this morning is something we can achieve in our own effort? There's no way. Not a chance. This is a supernatural life that requires supernatural power. And therefore, what Paul is saying is is we need to develop a supernatural prayer life. That's why this prayer is recorded for us in Scripture. It's a model. It teaches us what to pray for. And it shows us how to become intercessors. Parents, imagine praying this prayer for your children. What kind of transformation could God produce in their life? Husbands, imagine praying this for your wives. Ladies, wake up now. How would you like to see your husband become the kind of man Paul describes in these verses? We can pray this prayer over and over for ourselves. We can pray it over and over again for others because our love always needs to abound more and more. We always need to approve the things that are excellent. We always need to be sincere and blameless, looking forward to the day of Christ, bearing the fruit of righteousness for the praise and glory of God. So as we close, I want to ask you the question that I posed earlier at the very beginning. How is your prayer life? 
Robert Murray McShane once said, What a man is on his knees before God, that he is and nothing more. Wow, that's powerful. It would be tragic, I think, for us to walk away from this message unchanged. And so my hope, my prayer has been for for our church family that all of us this week and in the, the months to come, that we will grow in this area of intercession, of deep praying for transformation to take place in our own hearts, in our own lives, and the lives of uh, people around us, our our church family. So maybe today, you will join the Punjab Prayer Union by answering yes to those five questions and committing uh, to pray for half an hour a day. Or maybe you will sign up to be part of America Praise, a movement of churches around the globe that are committed to praying for our cities 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Or maybe God will lead you to commit to coming uh, and joining our boiler room prayer meeting that meets every Sunday morning at 8.30 a.m. We gather together to pray for this church, to pray for the service, to pray for our pastors and the messages and the people watching uh, these online. Maybe you will commit to coming to Dawn Patrol, which is our prayer weekly prayer meeting for men every Thursday morning at 6 a.m. Maybe today you're going to walk out of here and you say, God, I want to pray. I want to commit to praying Philippians 1, 9 through 11 for this person that you're putting on my heart. I'm going to pray this intercessory prayer for that person, and I'm not going to give up until I see a transformation. But the point is, Do something. Do something to get excited about your prayer life. Are you excited about spending time with God in prayer? And if you're like me, my heart can become pale. My heart can become cold. And I feel that ache. I feel that ache that that we read in those questions. I can't go on without that power. God, I need more of You. I want more of You. And the only way to get that is by drawing near to Him in prayer. Loving Him. Receiving His love for you. Enjoying communion. Enjoying sweet fellowship. That's what Paul's praying for us. That's what I'm praying for all of us. And so as we close our time together, I thought, wow, how do I pray? There's a prayer that's already inspired. It's perfect. I can't improve on it. Let's pray it together for ourselves. Amen? I've changed the words just just a tiny little bit so that we can pray this corporately for ourselves. Let's pray this out loud. We got it up on the screen. And this we pray that our love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that we may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. As you know, if you've been a campus for any length of time, you know that we are a sending body missionally. We love to support our missionaries, but we not only are a sending body, we are a giving body. We love to help those who are hurting and who are in need. Scripture calls us to care for the widows and orphans and those who are in need. And there are plenty who are in need right now, right? Four times a year, we take a love offering. It's called our love offering. We take those funds and do we distribute it to those who are in need and we haven't taken this offering in a while but just because we haven't taken it in a while doesn't mean the needs have stopped we literally take these funds and, and are the hands and feet to those who are maybe struggling with the rent maybe struggling with the pg e payment maybe needing a plane ticket to get someone who's got COVID so as the men come forward, we're going to take this offering. Please give generously, give hilariously, that we may be uh, able to just 
impact someone's life. I can speak personally from the effects of this offering. It's an amazing ministry we have that this committee gets to spread the love of Jesus with a financial gift. So let's pray. Father, there are so many around the world that are hurting right now. Pray for those who are hurting with COVID issues. Pray for those who are uh, in Haiti right now. Dealing with the loss and the tragedy over there. Those who are in Afghanistan. God, just the confusion, the chaos. Those who are hurt, trapped. But Father, we also pray for our community. Those who are hurting across the street, next door. Those are in this particular body right here. God, there are people I know who are struggling financially, emotionally, spiritually. Pray that you would take these funds that we collect and that you would guide us to those who are hurting, that we may be able to share a cup of water, a loaf of bread with somebody. I pray that you would just bless this offering, that you would bless those who will be the recipients of it. We thank you for this church. Thank you for being uh, the city on a hill, this light that we get to be in this city. What an opportunity. I thank you for each one that's here, for each one that you're putting on their heart right now to, to give a financial gift. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we respond to this challenge of being people of prayer, conduits of God, and the spirit of caring for others in the love fund, let's sing this together. Say, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, dry and true. hear me what a beautiful prayer what a beautiful way to close our our time together thank you for for coming thank you for being here if maybe maybe you're visiting today maybe this is your very first time and just want to remind you as you as you head out if you never had a chance to 
kind of introduce yourself. Let us know that you're here. If you'd just stop by the information center, we just want to give you a gift and, and thank you for, for joining us this morning. I want to give a, a personal invitation to the men uh, to come to this dinner on Thursday night, 6.30 right here, right, right in the Maple Auditorium. Our guest speaker is going to be Roger Manassian, the man who founded Hope Now for Youth, a ministry that is reaching out to gang members and, and, and bringing them off the streets and, and giving them jobs and, and transforming families. And, but the theme for this dinner is fatherhood. Where are the fathers? And Malachi talked about how, how that there would be this famine uh, in, our, in our generations that where, that where fathers, their hearts would need to be turned to their own children. And how many of us in our own families need the hearts of our children to be turned to our fathers? This is going to be a powerful theme. We're going to hear a testimony from a young, a young man who was on the verge of suicide. And Roger Manassian, saw something in this young man. He saw something and he reached out to him. And God used him to lead him to Christ and saved his life. It's going to be a beautiful time. Guys, would you join us? Would you sign up? Would you let us know if you could sign up today uh, so that we can order the right amount of food? And I really want to encourage you to be there. Father, we thank You so much for this day. Thank You for the fellowship that we have in Your Spirit. Thank You for the power of Your Word. Uh, Your Word is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It is able to pierce and penetrate into our heart and even uh, expose the motives of our heart. And so we pray that Your Word would bear fruit today in our lives. I pray that we wouldn't forget this prayer that we just talked about. That it would be something that we turn back to and we pray it for ourselves, for our families, our kids, our spouse. Lord, more than anything, we just want to say we love You. We're so blessed. We're people who've received grace upon grace and we don't deserve it. We never did. We never will. But we thank You for it today. Help us to be worshipers as we go out those doors. That we would be the same people Monday through Saturday as we are when we put on our church clothes and come into this building on Sunday. Lord, help us to live for You and love You and shine Your light. All God's people said, Amen. God bless you guys. You have a wonderful week.